In this episode, we're going to be looking at Psalm 18. And this is a long psalm. Um, so we're just going to jump right into it. I'll just say, if you haven't already subscribed, we'd love for you to do that. And if you missed previous episodes in this series, everything is in a playlist here on the channel, as well as all kinds of other teaching videos, interviews with scholars, all that stuff. So check out the playlist. If you don't do that, if you're just used to pulling up and looking at whatever YouTube shows you, take the time to click on the playlist tab and look around see what we have here at Disciple Dojo, because we really are building an online archived library of biblical teaching material. And you can help us continue to do that by subscribing, liking, sharing, commenting, all those things that help any channel grow. Okay, let's jump right into Psalm 18. Now, I said this is a long psalm, and it is. This is the third longest psalm in the Bible. There's only two others that are longer than this one. Those are Psalm 78 and Psalm 119. So it'll be quite a while before we get to those. So we're going to go through, we're going to note the high points, we're going to get an overall feel for what this song is about, and then draw some conclusions from it. Now, remember in Psalm 17, we talked about how there was some comparison between that and the prayer of the righteous sufferer, which was an ancient uh, Akkadian hymn. And it even said, you know, he threw me down, then he lifted me on high. He snatched the jaw of death. He raised me up from hell. This is from volume one of Context of Scripture, edited by William Hallow, if you're interested. But this is this is a non-Israelite, non-biblical uh, prayer to a Babylonian God. Well, the biblical account has similarities and dissimilarities, just like all biblical literature, because it did come from the same world in which those cultures lived. So you're going to see now, just as in the last Psalm, there were similarities and dissimilarities between the prayer of the righteous sufferer and the psalmist in Psalm 17, crying out for justice and deliverance and lamenting basically to God. Now in Psalm 18, we're going to see a psalm that's kind of like a royal celebratory psalm of God doing just that. This is kind of like God answering the prayer that was cried in Psalm 17. And throughout the ancient Near East, whenever kings would commemorate uh, glorious victories, usually attributing their success to the gods backing them because of their might, because of their strength, their power. Uh, here's an example. This is from a carving of Ramses on the temple wall. This is at Karnak. And it uh, gives the background of him subduing and making a treaty with the Hittites. And this is a victory carving of King Naram Sin. And you can see that king here. And he actually has what looks like a Viking helmet. Uh, Vikings never wore horns in history. That's a much later trope. But people in the ancient Near East did, at least artistically, they depicted themselves with horns. Don't know if this guy wore horns around or not. But you can see here the king deified there's the the sun or moon or celestial body of some type shining down. He's trampling on his disfigured corpses of his enemies. And this this is a commemorating his victory over them, you know, holding a spear or an arrow or a scepter or something in his strong right arm. It even goes back to Sumerian, to the old Babylonian period. Here's an example of a hymn celebrating the storm god, Ishkur. It says, when the great warrior goes out from his house, indeed, he is a fierce lion. When Father Ishkur walks upon the earth, indeed, the earth rumbles. When my Lord walks in the marshes, indeed, he is a roaring storm. And then later, an Egyptian hymn to the god Amun describes him as a warrior. It says, Amun, who takes to battle, trusting his strength, mountains tremble beneath him when he rages. Earth quakes when he utters the war cry. All creation is in fear and terror of him. And then the Assyrian king, Tiglath-Pileser, in one of the recorded boastings of his military might, it says, by the attack of his fierce weapons, he has caused the four corners of the world to quake. So the reason that I bring that up is because when we read Psalm 18, we're going to see a lot of that same ancient Near East imagery being wrapped up in this psalm. And similarly, while we don't have inscriptions, at least not very many, of battle accounts of the Hebrews during the monarchy, we do actually, Psalm 18 is almost verbatim found in 2 Samuel 22. At the end of David's life as sort of a summation, it's it's like a 2 Samuel 22, probably an older version, uh, or at least Psalm 18 is maybe a more polished version, but they are 
the same song for all intents and purposes, a few minor differences, a few spelling differences. So Psalm 18 is the closest thing to a, an inscription that we find of the Davidic monarchy. It's not an inscription in stone. It's not a carving, but it is inscribed in scripture, so to speak. And like other ancient Near East accounts, it uses some of the same imagery, the imagery of storm, the imagery of shaking of the earth, the imagery of God being a mighty warrior. Where it differs from other ancient Near East accounts is the might and the power is never really ascribed to the king whether it's David or whether this was written for a later Davidic king uh, or whether it looks forward to the Messiah himself. And so that's important to note as we start reading this, sort of setting expectations of what type of song is this. And remember, we've said this before, this is a song. That's what the Psalms are. These are song lyrics. We're not getting a detailed biographical sketch. We're not getting a historical account. It may have elements of those things, but we are primarily getting song. So in songs, just like in all good poetry, images are extreme. You have hyperbole. You have artistic depiction of things that if you were actually looking at it through a camera lens, it wouldn't look that way. But to describe it in song, of course you would use more exalted language. So that's incredibly important, not just for studying Psalm 18, but for studying all the Psalms. We have to keep in mind, don't read these like you would read other books in the Bible. Read these like you would read song lyrics from an album you just bought, because that's the genre of writing that we're looking at. And so a corollary to that is when it comes to tense, when it comes to when things took place, sometimes you read this psalm in one translation and it has things in the past tense, like Yahweh, you did such and such. But in other translations, the same verses will be put in the future tense or the optative tense. So Yahweh, you will do or may you do such and such. And some translations may just leave it flat in the present tense. Yahweh, you do such and such. Well, this is due to the nature, not just of this as poetry, as song lyrics, but also to the nature of Hebrew itself, biblical Hebrew and its verb tense system. In commenting on this, Michael Wilcock, this is from the Bible Speaks Today series. He unpacks this a little bit for readers. He says, some say that this is David's past experience others that it's his future expectation. If we are unfamiliar with the Hebrew language, these conflicting opinions confront us with what may seem one of its oddest features. For us, the verbs in a sentence mostly describe either what happened in the past or what is happening in the present or what will happen in the future. That is what we mean, broadly speaking, by the tenses of a verb. Hebrew tenses are not like that. Although confusingly, they use the terms perfect and imperfect. Those are the two tenses that you have in Hebrew, you have perfect tense and imperfect tense, which in Western languages denote two types of past tense. Hebrew is more interested in whether the action of a verb is continuous, and that's what the imperfect is. It's continuous action from the perspective of the narrator or the author, or has been completed, an action that's already done, and that's what the perfect tense is denotes in Hebrew. It often leaves us to infer from the context whether that action is past, present, or future. And so he goes on to say, these technicalities explain why in, say, verses 37 and 38, the NIV has, I pursued, they fell, past tense. The Jerusalem Bible has present tense, I pursue, and they fall. And the Revised Version has, I will pursue, and they shall fall. Surely one translation must be right and the other's wrong, but no, the verb forms cannot in themselves answer that question. And any of the three versions could be correct. And so this is important when this is why we use multiple translations, because I know most viewers, most of you watching this can't read Hebrew and that's okay. But if you can't read Hebrew and you're studying the Hebrew Bible, then you need to at least be aware of how the Hebrew language works so that you can look at how various translations deal with a passage and not immediately do what some people do and say, oh, this version is trying to change the text. This version is corrupt or this version is wicked or, you know, you, you don't get sucked into all those nonsensical claims. What you can realize is, oh, OK, there's probably a good reason that they're going with this translation. And even if I don't agree with it, I can at least understand 
how they got that. And generally that's what you're going to find no matter which translation you're using, whether more ancient translations like the King James or more modern translations like the NASB 2020 or the CSB. So it's a long introduction. We haven't even started the Psalm yet, but it's just, that's important to keep in mind. It's going to figure into how we interpret this psalm. So we're going to look at Psalm 18. This is Derek Kidner has uh, referred to this psalm or kind of uh, titled this psalm in his commentary, A Warrior King Looks Back. And from where it's placed in 2 Samuel, that's kind of, if we were going to situate this in history, especially with David, that's where we would probably put it, as this is kind of at the end of David's life looking back, broadly categorizing his reign. However, Others might say, no, if we're going to link this to David, this could be at the beginning of his reign when when his throne has just been established, but before the whole Bathsheba stuff and family dissolution and his, you know, his sad ending to his life. So even though that's where the psalm appears in 2 Samuel, it could be a psalm written earlier in David's life to commemorate those early victories when he was on the rise. And you could make a good contextual argument for that as well. Lastly, some would say, no, this is not written by David at all. This is written la David, to David, for David, in honor of David. And it's meant to kind of use David as the prototypical king of Israel, and then to be something that all of the kings of Israel can sing in celebration of God giving them victory. And ultimately, it finds its true fulfillment in the son of David, the long-awaited Messiah, whoever he may be, where this psalm will reach its fullest application. So a lot will depend on how we translate the title of the psalm, the superscription in English Bibles, but which in Hebrew and Greek is verse 1. So it begins like so many of the songs, Lam Natseach, to, and I've just left it transliterated as normal, the director, whatever, La Eved Adonai, for or to the servant of Yahweh, Eved means servant or slave, for David. But then there's some added contextual information. It goes on after for David, who spoke to Yahweh the words of this song. That's what this all together says. On the day Yahweh delivered, and this literally says from the palm, we might say from the hand of, but hand would be miyad. This is mikaf, literally from the palm of all his enemies. And then another parallel, this does use from the hand, miyad from the hand of, and the Hebrew Masoretic text says Shaul, and that's the name for Saul, from the hand of Saul. So that would place this as after David was delivered from the hand of Saul, then that would put it earlier in his reign. This is the song he composed and sang, so like his coronation song. Interestingly, though, you don't have to change the consonants if you just repoint Shaul to Sheol, then it becomes Yahweh delivered him from the palm of his enemies from the hand of Sheol, personified the grave. That's, I think that's possible as well, especially since elsewhere in this song, he's going to talk about being delivered from death. So, and maybe the ambiguity is intentional, uh, but as it reads, it says delivered from the hand of Shaul, Saul. And so now, at least in the English Bibles, the psalm begins, verse 2 in Hebrew, Vayomer Erchamcha. And he said, and I've translated Erchamka as, I yearn for you. Now, most of the English translations, the vast majority, just have it simply as, I love you. NIV, I love you. Even Lexham English, I love you. King James, I will love thee. Old JPS, I love thee. All of the standard versions, I love, 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 love. The Dead Sea Scrolls translates, I tenderly care for you. O Lord. And the Tanakh has, I adore you, O Lord. Now, the Septuagint, the Greek translation, I think most of the modern ones are using that as their guide for how to take this. It just uses agapao, where we, you know, the word agape, I love. Agapeso say, I love you. But the Hebrew, this verb, racham, this is the verb that means to comfort or to be moved inwardly to have compassion or to have mercy on. You know, in the great poem, Isaiah 40, it begins, comfort, comfort my people. This is the verb it uses, racham. And so the question would be, well, how can, you know, it's 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 
a, a stronger person saying it to a weaker person would make sense. But the king saying it to God, you know, I have compassion for you, God. That doesn't make sense contextually. Um, I, I care for, I love, and that's what the Septuagint was bringing out most likely is this, it, it denotes love. It's a way of saying, I love you, but it's not the normal, typical way of saying, I love you, in, at least in Hebrew. And so I, I think I like how the Dead Sea Scroll translation does it. I tenderly care for you. I inwardly, like I feel something for you. That, that's kind of what Racham means in almost all of the other contexts when it's used. And so I try to bring that out with not just I love you, Lord, but I yearn for you. I, I'm moved for you, not with compassion, because nobody has compassion on God. The great medieval Jewish thinker, Ibn Ezra, when he came to this, he translated it as, I beg compassion of you. Like, so he recognized that Racham means to have compassion, but of course, a person can't have compassion for God, but a person can beg for God to have compassion for them. So regardless, this means something more than just, I love you, God. You know, if he wanted to say that, he'd, he'd use the verb ahav. That's the normal way that you talk about love in the Hebrew Bible. But using racham is very interesting. At the very least, it connotes that this love is something deeper. It's something that the psalmist feels at his gut level. And then he's going to go on and give a bunch of military imagery now. And this is a royal kingly psalm of thanksgiving and deliverance. So it should come as no surprise that military imagery dominates it. But not just military imagery, wilderness military imagery. We see that in the opening verse. And he said, I yearn for you. I love you. However you want to translate Racham. Yahweh, my strength. Yahweh, my rock and my mountain fortress. These are all terms that should bring to mind a place of protection in the wilderness kind of like the places where David and his men would flee from Saul and seek shelter and seek protection. And lo and behold, look at the next part, umpalti, and I translated this as helping me escape. Some would say, and my deliverer, which is fine. I just, it's the, the sense of the verb is one who is, it's a causative, one who's causing me or making me, and then palat to, to escape, to flee. So one helping me escape, ali tsuri, my God, my rock. And Sur and Salah are two different ways of saying rock. Just like in English, we say stone, rock, boulder, pebble. You know, they're just kind of like different types of rocks. And so Hebrew has the same thing as well. My God, my rock, I take refuge in him. Mageni, my shield, Vakaren yishi, and horn of my salvation. Horn being a symbol of strength and not just any kind of strength, but strength that brings salvation, deliverance. And just like whenever you see salvation in most other Psalms, this is the word Yasha, where the name Yeshua, Jesus, comes from, my salvation. And he ends it, Misgavi, my stronghold or my fortress. So all of these together is he, this is the God that he loves, he yearns for, he's moved for, the God who has been his protection, who has protected the king. And while the king was in, if this is of David, of course, David did flee uh, and move around in the wilderness to these various strongholds. Think of like the cave of Adullam. Think of the wilderness of En Gedi, these different places where David had to move about that offered him protection from his enemies. In the song, those are now, it's like those places that were for protection pointed to the one who was providing them, who himself was protection, my God, my rock. And now the Psalm is going to, in the next section, and I've kind of grouped these in sections so you can see like this is all one part. Let me take the box off, there we go. So you can see this is kind of one section all together. And now we're moving into the next section of the Psalm. And you're gonna see this kind of alternation between the Psalm as being talking about things or experiencing things in the heights and then in the depths and the heights and the depths. It's going to be this kind of alternating sense. And it's because what the psalmist is doing, these song lyrics are meant to not just talk about, I mean, they are talking about earthly deliverance of a, a pursued military figure, but they are imbuing it with cosmic significance. You're going to hear elements of the song of deliverance that Moses sang at the Exodus crossing. There are going to be echoes of the events that Ezekiel sees when God appears and rides upon the cherubim, 
You're going to hear echoes of Psalm 29, which itself is an adaptation, a, a reclaiming of a song that was likely originally sung to Baal as the storm god. You're going to see all of that imagery like kind of put in the lyrical blender in order to denote the deliverance that God gave his Davidic king. You'll hear echoes of Jonah. You'll hear terms that had resonance in the wider Near East culture for things like death, Sheol, the grave. And so I'll kind of point some of those out as we go. But the main thing is just to experience the song. I won't read all of the Hebrew, but I'll point out a few interesting things here and there. So it begins, being praised, I call Yahweh. So Yahweh is the one who is being praised and he's being praised through the person calling him. You, you might say, I call upon. Uh, there's no preposition here. It's just, I call and then Yahweh. But as a result, from my enemy, I am saved. Saved from what? Well, it tells you, verse five, verse four in English, they encompass me, chavale maveth. And this is literally ropes of or cords of death. This is snare imagery, um, like trap imagery, hunt imagery, the person being trapped, being hunted, being snared by death. And then it switches to water imagery and rivers of Belial, they terrify me. So they encompass me, ropes of death and rivers of Belial, they terrify me. Now, what in the world? Why did I first, why did I leave Belial transliterated and not translate it? Well, I did it because don't exactly know the best way to translate rivers of Belial. The Lexham English says ropes of death encircled me and streams of ruin overwhelmed me. So Belial could be translated as ruin. In IV, cords of death entangled me, the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. King James, the sorrows of death, they don't translate this literally. In this case, cords and ropes become sorrows. The sorrows of death compassed me, older way of saying surround me, and floods of ungodly men made me afraid. So they're taking Belial as ungodly men. And that comes from earlier in scripture and Torah and other places. The phrase uh, sons of Belial is used to describe like useless, good for nothings. JPS, old JPS just leaves it. Cords of death compassed me and the floods of Belial assailed me. Tanakh did the same thing. They just kept it. Torrents of Belial terrified me. Septuagint says pains of death surrounded me and torrents of lawlessness troubled me. Dead Sea Scrolls, torrents of perdition struck me with fear. And that's what the revised and new revised go, both go with torrents of perdition. ESV kind of updates the perdition part, but leaves it torrents of destruction. And that's what the NASB goes with as well as do the CSB, HCSB. The message in its colorful way as usual says, the hangman's noose was tight at my throat, devil waters rushed over me. So translating or associating Belial with the devil, uh, this just kind of makes me think of Billy Madison. <laughs> Don't tell me my business, devil woman, uh, devil waters. I, it's just, it's colloquial, it's weird, but that's the message. And Eugene Peterson intentionally tries to rephrase things to make you think. But there was a good note that I found in John Golden Gay's commentary on the Psalms. And I think it helps give you the options of what we're looking at. So if you're interested, this is, uh, it's three volumes. This is Psalms and it's 141. This is in the Baker commentary on the Old Testament wisdom and Psalms. Let's see, there you go. Better view here on camera. I have it zoomed in so you can actually see the paragraph, but this is, that's the commentary. And in commenting on this passage, he says, some might understand Belial as combining Beli and Ya'al so that it means worthlessness. This fits most Old Testament occurrences of the word and another example of which would be Psalm 101 verse 3. But the picture of Belial's overwhelming torrents carries other resonances. Others might see the word as combining Beli and Allah. And so Bali would mean without, that's the way you would say without, and Allah is to go up. And so thus this is suggesting without ascending. In other words, Sheol is the place from which no one comes up. So rivers of Belial would be rivers where nobody comes back from. They could also link the word with Bala, which means swallow, for death's torrents do swallow people. So the Hebrew word swallow is Bala. So Belial is, it's like a wordplay or just, it, it's meant to connote the idea of these rivers that swallow you up. 
down into the grave. This would also connect with the personification of death in Canaanite theology and the way Belial becomes a name for Satan. Belial would later become one of the names of Satan. And then there's a footnote that just says, for more on that, see the Dictionary of Demons and Deities in the Bible, as well as Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. So there's some ambiguity when it comes to how we should translate rivers of or torrents of Belial. And that makes for an interesting study if anybody really wants to dig deep, but there's nothing, I don't think there's anything super esoteric. There's certainly, you know, you don't want to get into all of this like satanic demonology. I, for my own money, I think Nahale Belial, rivers of Belial, floods of Belial, I think it's a way of saying ropes of death, cords of death, because in the very next verse, we see it's not now Hevele Maveth, it's Chavale Sheol, cords of Sheol, or ropes of Sheol, encircle me. And they meet me, or they encounter me, or we would say I encounter them, but literally it's, and they meet me, snares of death. And there you can see Maveth. And so the imagery comes full circle from ropes of death to snares of death. So these are just, it's just poetic way. They encompass me, ropes of death. Rivers of Belial terrify me. Ropes of Sheol encircle me. They meet me, snares of death. It's just all different ways of saying what the psalmist is feeling, which is that he is trapped. He is encircled. He is ensnared. He is encompassed. And so, verse 7, in narrowness to me, which we would say in my distress, in my, it, literally in my being confined, in my being squeezed together, ekra Yahweh, I call Yahweh, which is exactly the phrase that this section began with. So in my distress, in all of this, I called to Yahweh and to my God, I cried for help. And in response, he heard from his temple or from his palace, Hekal can mean either temple or palace. It just literally means his house. My voice, Koli, and my cry for help before his face, she came into his ears. He heard from his temple my voice and my cry for help to his face or before him. To his face is how you idiomatically say before him or in his presence in Hebrew. My cry for help came into his ears. So this is someone crying out to God and God hearing their prayer, hearing their cry. And now God's going to answer. And this next section is very long. It starts in English verse 7, Hebrew verse 8, and it goes all the way down to verse 15 in English. This is just the page break because this is in Microsoft Word. So as a result of the cry coming to God's ears, now we get a theophany. Now we get a very Mount Sinai-like, Ezekiel-like, Psalm 29-like appearance of God in the might of a storm. What you have here is Yahweh's military deliverance depicted with cosmic storm imagery. Think back to Judges 5 of sun stands still, you know, that whole passage, which we've talked about here. If you want to know what's going on in that passage uh, and whether the sun actually literally stands still in the sky or, or whether something else is going on, check out the video here on that chapter of Judges in our Judges playlist. But this is very similar to that in what's happening. Military victory, cosmic imagery to describe it. From the depths where he cries out, just like Jonah crying out for God in literally in the depths of the sea. Uh, here, the king is crying out to God from the depths, what looks like going down into the grave, ropes of Sheol, all that. Now we go back to the heights. And I'm going to keep it very literal so you can kind of get a feel for how the Hebrew is worded. But it says literally, and she shakes and she quakes the land and foundations of the mountains, they tremble and they shake, for he is angry at it, or you could translate this word low as to him. In other words, for there is anger to him, meaning he is very angry. Little uncertainty on who the him is referring to. If it's him, it's referring to God and his anger. If it's it, it's referring to his anger shaking creation, or it could possibly maybe be um, his anger is towards him, meaning the one oppressing the psalmist, who the psalmist is asking deliverance for, there's ambiguity here. And for those who are God's people in loving covenant relationship with God, God's anger is a wonderful thing because it's going to be directed against those 
who are oppressing his covenant people. If you are opposed to God, if you set yourself against the covenant God, Yahweh, then his anger is the worst thing imaginable. So it continues with this storm imagery. Think of like earthquake, volcano, thunder, lightning. In in ancient world, lightning and fire are not always distinguished. I mean, they're the same thing. So to say fire fell from the sky, you know, we think of like like a blowtorch blowing down, but fire falling from the sky is how you would say lightning in the ancient world as well. And so we read verse nine, eight in English, smoke went up in his nose and, and in his nose is also nose is the word for anger in Hebrew as well. So you could say in his anger. So whether it's talking about smoke coming from his nostrils, like in his nostrils and then coming out. So the image, you know, just think of like poetically, like somebody so angry that they're like smoke is blowing out. You know, you see this in cartoons sometimes. It could be something like that. Again, this is poetry. We have to be careful of anthropomorphizing things too far. But in his anger or in his nose, which same thing, smoke went up and fire from his mouth consumed coals they burned from it so this is either like volcanic type imagery or this is lightning from a dark smoky cloud imagery next verse he spread the sky and came down and thick darkness under his feet verse 11 and he mounted up on a cherub karuv and flew and he swooped down on wings of ruach wings of wind or wings of the spirit. But here, just like in Ezekiel 1, when Ezekiel has his vision of God, he appears mounted on a cherub and therefore he's carried, he swoops down on spiritual wings, or you could say wings of the wind. All of this, again, poetic imagery. Next verse, and he set darkness as his covering all around him, his sukkah. And I've left it as sukkah. Our Jewish friends just celebrated Sukkot. That's where they go, you know, if you're observant Jew, you you build a sukkah, you build a little booth, a little uh, shelter, and you go out and you camp in it or you eat in it or, you know, you're supposed to live in it according to Torah. But that's sukkah, sukkot, the holiday. Well, God's sukkah in this image is darkness. Darkness is his covering. This is Sinai imagery, the thick darkness and the cloud, darkness of water, clouds of clouds. And these are two different Hebrew words for clouds. We just don't have those words in English. Clouds of other types of clouds. I I don't know. This is a challenge to render in English. Some translations have uh, thick clouds of the skies. Some have thick clouds, darkness of waters, dark rain clouds, storm clouds, black clouds. So this is God showing up in a storm. This is a storm theophany. Verse 13, and 13, there's a little bit of textual ambiguity here. It says from, I'll just read it literally, from brightness before him, his clouds passed, hails and coals of fire. And there's a little assonance here, avav, avru. This is the word for his clouds and then this verb. And it usually means to cross or to pass, avar. Someone said, no, it shouldn't be avru, but you should switch these two letters. Metathesis, they, they got jumbled. And it should be avur, which would mean produce. So from the brightness before him, his clouds produce hail and coals of fire, which, you know, that's what storm clouds will bring about. This would be, again, hail and lightning would be what this is referring to. And others have said, no, the whole metathesis thing is right, but it's not, it shouldn't be avur, it should be ba'aru. So these are the letters that should be switched. Ba'ar is to burn. So ba'aru is they burned. So from brightness before him, his clouds burned hail and coals of fire. So just the lightning storm imagery. I, whichever of these three is most likely, I think they all make sense. You've got God's glory, brightness, whether it's lightning flashing, whether it's the sun. And how can you have brightness and dark clouds? That that seems to contradict. Not at all. If you've ever seen a really bad thunderstorm when the sun's out, you can have, well, there's the sun, but there's this terrifying darkness. And sometimes from you know modern shelters, it's actually cool to sit there and see the sun, but also the, this 
thunderstorm blowing across the land. When you live in the ancient Near East in, in tents or mud brick huts, it's a little scarier. Either way, regardless, verse 13, 14 in Hebrew, and he thundered in the heavens, Yahweh. And Elion gave his voice. And Elion could be translated as most high. Once again, hail and coals of fire. So this is, these are parallel. You can see that these are song lyrics and it's ending with this refrain, hail and coals of fire, hail and coals of fire. But that's what giving his voice, this is, this is for thunder. You read Psalm 29 and we'll get to that not too far into the future, I hope. And it's all about the coal Yahweh, the, the voice of God and the thundering. And that's what thunder is. And along with thunder, what do you have? You have lightning. And that's what we see in the next verse, verse 15, 14 in English. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. And his lightning he shot and it disoriented them. God's using like a storm against the enemies of the psalmist. And not just any storm, but a, a powerful storm. It says, and they were seen rivers of water and they were uncovered the foundations of the world from your rebuke, Yahweh, from the breath of the wind of your knows or of your anger. This is stock imagery in the Old Testament, in the ancient Near East world of, of the, the breath of God, the blowing of the spirit, even laying bare the foundations of the earth. That's what this rivers of water or channels of the deep, some have translated or channels of the sea. Uh, this is referring to the primordial waters, which were associated with the foundations of the world and them being uncovered or laid bare at the breath of God, God blowing his breath. This is Exodus imagery. This is how the Exodus, the, the parting of the sea would be described in very similar terms to this elsewhere in scripture. And so we've gone from the heights now back down to the depths. He stretched out from on high. He took me, he drew me out from great waters. That's the imagery of, of suffering, of being assailed by your enemies is, is, is like drowning in great waters. God drew him out. He delivered me from my enemy strong. We would say my strong enemy, but I wanted to preserve the poetry here. And from one hating me, that's another word for enemy, the one who hates me, for he was stronger than me. So God rescuing. And this is where you see the antithesis between this and other ancient Near East battle accounts. In the other ancient Near East records, the king would be the one who is strong and his enemy would be the one who's weak. You'd never have Tiglath-Pileser or any of these other kings admitting that their enemy was stronger than them. No, that's unthinkable. They are stronger and that's why they win. But in this case, the enemy is stronger. The psalmist is weak. He cries out to God. God rescues him because God is stronger than even the strongest of enemies. They met me on the day of my disaster and Yahweh was a support to me. He brought me out to a wide open place he pulled me out for he delights in me. So the idea, remember in the previous section, he was snared, his narrowness, he was in, you know, being closed in. So the opposite of that, the rescue of that is being brought lem rahav to wide open, broad places. This is, by the way, the word where Rahab gets her name in Joshua, rahav, and, and literally it means broad or wide open. And it's a great double entendre in the Joshua account because Rahab was abroad um, in the sense of she was a prostitute, uh, she was very open. That's what prostitutes were. They are considered wide open spaces into which people go. And so there's, it's a fun pun on the name. And actually she becomes the one who delivers the spies and is brought into Israel and makes it into the line of King David himself and ultimately of Jesus. It's a fun wordplay going on with Rahav. But God brought him out. He pulled me out for he delights in me. Ki hafetz bi. And then we move into the next section. And this section gives people problems if they try to read it as David looking back on his life. Because this is not going to sound like David. This is going to sound like early David. And that's why some people think this is better fitting at the beginning of David's life. Or... Possibly this is forensic language. This is courtroom language, not moral language. 
So verse 20 in English, 21 in Hebrew, Yahweh requited me, returned to me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hand, he returned to me or he gave me back what my cleanness of hand deserved. So this is claiming because I'm righteous, Yahweh paid me back with righteousness. That's why people say, mm, this can't be David writing later in his life. Others say, no, it's just an idealized, it, it's, it's optative. It's aspirational. It's what all the kings should be able to claim because they live their lives based on Torah. Now, whether they do is a different question because, again, this is a song. So this is what the king, the ideal king of Israel, should be able to sing and should be able to say. Not what later David in his life was able to say, possibly what early David would have been able to say before his downward slide but certainly what the ultimate son of David will be able to say. So take it as you will, but let's just read this section. It says, For I guarded the way of Yahweh. I did no wickedness away from my God. In other words, I did no wickedness apart from God. I didn't go away from God and do wickedness. It's awkward in English. For all his judgments are before me, and his statutes I did not remove from me. And this is referring to Torah. And Deuteronomy said the king was to write a copy of Torah, every king of Israel, so that they could read it and meditate on it. So this ideal king in this song is doing that. Verse 23, 24 in Hebrew, and I was tamim with him. I was tamim. This is that word, perfect, upright, whole, integrity. And I guarded myself from my iniquity. And Yahweh returned to me according to my righteousness. There's the refrain. There's this word again. According to the cleanness of my hand before his eyes. So these two terms repeated. And so verse 26, it says, With a faithful one, a chassid, and we've seen the chassid before throughout the Psalms, just one who is faithful. With a faithful one, you show yourself faithful. And this is all one verb. It means like you yourself are faithful. You behave faithfully or you make yourself, it's reflexive. Uh, it's, I believe it's in the Hithpael stem, which is kind of a reflexive, an action you do with yourself. So with a faithful one, you yourself are faithful. With a man of Tamim, or this could be a uh, Gabar, could also be a man or warrior, mighty man, with a man, tamim, there's the word again, tamim, you show yourself tamim, or you yourself are tamim. With a pure one, you yourself are pure. And the Septuagint, by the way, translate this pure. They have it as with the chosen or the elect, you are elect, you are chosen. Don't know exactly what that means, but I'm not a Septuagint scholar. But the Hebrew text, with a pure one, you yourself are pure, with a twisted one, you yourself are patal, twisted. Uh, it, it can mean like warped. It could mean, it, it's where the word, the name Naphtali comes from. In Genesis 30, verse 8, the name of the tribe of Israel, Naphtali. In that context, it means struggle. So the name Naphtali has to do with the struggle it involves. So struggle, writhe, twist. But this is showing these verses, 26, 27, God is going to act to people the way they act. So with the faithful, he's faithful. With the tamim, he's tamim. With the pure, he's pure. But with the twisted, he grapples. He twists. And so this gives rise to the, all the different translations. Lexham English, uh, to the pure, you show yourself pure, but to the wicked, you show yourself shrewd. In IV, to the pure, you show yourself pure, but to the devious, you show yourself shrewd. King James, with the pure, thou wilt shew thyself pure. And this is just how you say show in King James English. And with the froward, thou wilt shew thyself froward. Uh, KJ only, folks, if you think this is easy to understand and that the plow boy, as our friend Mark Ward puts it, could readily understand the meaning of this, uh, you're just lying to yourself. This is almost unintelligible. So the JPS said, uh, with the pure, thou dost show thyself pure, and with the crooked, thou dost show thyself subtle. The updated Tanakh, with the pure, you act purely. With the perverse, you are wily. Like some English, with the chosen, you will be chosen, and with the twisted, you will twist about. The NRSV 
with the pure, you show yourself pure. With the crooked, you show yourself perverse. And the ESV, similarly, and with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. ESV prides itself on being a, a literal translation. That's a very uh, interpretive translation in this instance. In ASB, with the pure, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you show yourself astute. I actually like how Eugene Peterson says it in the message in this one. I think he does as good a job as any. The true people taste your truth. The bad ones can't figure you out. That's a surprisingly good way to translate this verse, I think. It really shouldn't be surprising, though. Eugene Peterson was very good at both Hebrew and Greek. People don't give him enough credit because the message is just so weird sometimes. But in that case, I think it nailed it. So the idea of God revealing or relating to people in a way that suits who they are. And so therefore, verse 28, 27 in English, for you, as or we would say as for you, an afflicted people you save. And exalted eyes or uplifted eyes, you humble, you bring down. For you yourself light my lamp. Yahweh, my God, you illuminate my darkness. And then verse 30, there's some textual issues here. 29 in English, I've just given you the Hebrew says, for in you, ki baka, for in you, arutz, I run, gadud, a ridge, or this could also be, gadud can also mean a raiding party. It's a homonym. It's got two different meanings. Uvelohai and in my God, or by my God, edaleg shur, I leap a wall. Now, there's a few different ways that this can go. The Septuagint actually has, for the first line, for in you I run a ridge. It has, I am delivered from a pirate gang, perateriu. Pirateri, pirate, a, literally a pirate gang. Um, and that's, you know, similar to like a raiding party. That's what pirates do. So what is this verse saying? If this is, if Gadud is translated as wall or ridge, then this is saying in you, I can run, a, I can run upon a ridge. Like I'm sure footed, like I, I'm not going to fall. If our roots is I run, it could be meaning not I run along, but I run up against, I advance against an, uh, either a wall or a raiding party, an army, forces, the forces that were out hunting for David in the wilderness, perhaps. And by God or in God, I can leap a wall, like I can get over a barricade, or I can leap along a wall, if that's what it's referring to. And so that's where you get the different translations. LEB for with you, I can charge a troop and with my God, I can scale a wall. NIV is similar. With your help, I can advance against a troop. I can scale a wall. King James, for by thee, I have run through a troop. And by my God, I have leapt over a wall. Tanakh, I can rush a barrier. I can scale a wall. Septuagint, I will be rescued from the gang of raiders. And in my God, I will scale the city wall. ESV, for by you, I can run against a troop. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. New American Standard, another literal translation that's having to add some stuff in to be interpretive. For by you, I can run at a troop of warriors. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. Holman Christian, uh, with you, I can attack a barrier. And with my God, I can leap over a wall. The CSB updated that to with you, I can attack a barricade. And with my God, I can leap over a wall. So there's just question on how you render this. And because sometimes words have more than one meaning, but that's the general sense is God is enabling this person to do what they got to do, whether it's in face of a mighty wall, whether it's along a ridge that's dangerous, or whether it's against a raiding party of the hostile forces. Either way, it doesn't matter for in God, we can do it all. Why? Well, we move into the next section, verse 31, the God, literally, that's what it says, Ha'el, the God, Tamim Darko, perfect is his way. The saying of Yahweh is refined, like, like refined meaning metallurgically refined, pure. A shield is he to all taking refuge in him. For who is God apart from Yahweh? And who is a rock except our God? The God girding me in valor or in strength, like like gearing me up in might. And he makes Tamim, he makes perfect my way, making my feet like the deer. And upon my heights, he makes me stand. This is very similar to the end of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter three, the very last verse of that. Teaching my hand to battle and it pulls back a bow of bronze, my arm. 
Like God's the one equipping him to be this victorious king, even to be to be able to pull. I mean, think of a bow. Like bows are made of flexible wood, so you can pull them back. So a bow made out of bronze, like you'd have to have gorilla strength to bend that thing. That's the image that's being used here. And you give to me the shield of your salvation and your right hand supports me and your humility, possibly your willingness to help your stooping down is what makes me great. So there's kind of like an ironic image. You're coming down, your humbling makes me great. And so you make wide my steps under me and they do not shake my ankles. I pursue my enemies and I overtake them and I do not return until I finish them. I smash them and they are not able to arise. They fall under my feet and you gird me in valor for battle. You cause to bow down those arising underneath me. Those who are those who are seeking to like rise up against me, we might say, rise underneath me. This is the king, the, the messianic king of Israel. This is the one all the way back to Psalm 2 that God has promised to make the nations his subjects and, and all of that. God is the one who causes the ones rising against him, underneath him to bow down. And my enemies give to me neck. That's literally what it says. My enemies give to me neck. And the image most likely is either they bow. And so if you bow your head, they give neck or they fall down and their neck is exposed, which is the most vulnerable part. And the ones hating me, I destroy them. They cry for help but there is no one saving them. Upon Yahweh or to Yahweh, they cry, but he does not answer them. And I beat them like dust upon the face of the wind, like muck outside, I empty them. Or like garbage, sewage, bleh, you just throw out the slime. So this is harsh imagery for sure. This is military imagery. This is defeat imagery. This is like conquering imagery. This verse has troubled people. They cry for help, but there is no one saving upon Yahweh, but he does not answer them. Doesn't the Bible say all who call upon the name of Yahweh will be saved? That's where we have to figure out what is being meant contextually by crying for help. Interestingly, in the ancient Near East, and this is again stock ancient Near East military imagery in this poem, in this song, in the ancient Near East, sometimes it it was very common to get the favor of your enemy's God so that they would help you beat your enemy. You would call upon and sacrifice to your enemy. So if I was going to attack this city and their God was Teshub, for instance, and that wasn't my God, But I might want to be on the good side because gods were territorial in the ancient world. So if I'm going to attack a city that worships Teshub, I might also hedge my bets by calling out to Teshub, maybe offering a sacrifice to him to kind of curry the favor of the local god whose people I was about to destroy. And then once they were destroyed, of course, then my god, whoever that is, becomes the god of that area because my god defeated Teshub or possibly because Teshub was like, meh, you can have them. I'll go somewhere else. So that's how it worked in the ancient world. So this contextually crying out to God for help, I would argue, and many commentators argue, is not referring to somebody crying out for salvation or recognizing that God is the one true God and turning to him. Because we know from scripture when people do that, people like Rahab, people like Caleb's ancestors, because he was a Kenizzite, people like Naaman, the Syrian, people like Ruth. We know when foreigners, non-Israelites cried out to God for help and salvation, legitimately God brought them into his people. God was the God who saved even the Gentiles when they called to him. This is not what's going on in this psalm. Contextually, this is in the sense of a battle campaign. And the enemies, the haters of the psalmist are who are crying out. The ones seeking to overthrow are who are crying out. And that cry does not get heard. God will not abandon his people to a stronger enemy just because that enemy also invokes his name. So as a result, the psalmist, this king of Israel now says, you help me escape the lawsuits of a people. And and this word, I've translated lawsuits because that's what this word reeve, it means a lawsuit, but don't think of like lawyers with suits and ties. Think of a complaint, a grievance an official inquiry before a higher court or whatever. That's that's kind of an opposition. The psalmist is saying, you help me escape that opposition, the ones who would come against me. You appoint me as head of nations, la roche goyim. This is also the word that can be translated as Gentiles, 
Goyim. And so now this psalmist is head of not just of Israel, but of nations. A people who do not know you, they will serve me. This is just what Psalm 2 also looked forward to, the nations raging against God and his anointed. Now that's what the psalmist is celebrating here. The people who don't even know you, now they serve me. Listening of ear, that's literally how you'd say this, they listen to me. The ones, basically we might say, the ones with ears to hear, listen to me. That should sound familiar. Another son of David said that one time. Foreigner sons, they cower before me. Foreigner sons... They wither and they come out trembling from their prisons. This is one of the longest Hebrew words, by the way. Mimis gorothehim. It's a long word. So even first are now bowing to the Messiah, cowering to the Messiah, coming out to encounter the Messiah, coming out from their prisons. Captives are being set free. Why? Because unlike Baal, who lives and dies and lives and dies and lives and dies every year with the seasons, unlike that, Chai Adonai. Alive is Yahweh, and blessed, Baruch Tsuri, blessed is my rock. And lifted high is the God of my salvation, the God giving vengeance to me, and he subdues people under me, helping me escape from my enemies. Indeed, from one standing against me, you raise me. From a man of violence, you deliver me. So they come to the end. Therefore, I praise you among the nations. Bagoyim Adonai, Yahweh. And to your name, I sing. Making great the salvation of his king and doing chesed. And we've seen chesed before. Kindness, loving kindness, mercy, steadfast love, faithfulness. God is doing that to his anointed one. This is Mashiach. So his king, his Messiah. To David and to his seed unto the ages. So look at this. Don't miss this. His king, God magnifies, he makes great, he, he multiplies, he, he embiggens, uh, to quote the Simpsons, the salvations, and this is plural, not just general salvation, but the saving acts of his king and doing chesed to his Messiah, to David, and to his Zerah, seed. This gets translated as descendants or offspring, but it's, it's the word seed, Zerah. This is the seed promise that goes all the way back to Genesis, back to the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent, the seed of Abraham, who if those who bless you, I'll bless, those who curse you, I'll curse, the seed ultimately who is in the line of David, who is Jesus. This is why Paul will say, God didn't make the promise to his seeds, plural, but to his seed, singular, because Zerah is a singular word. And ultimately, and Paul was using the wordplay because he knew Zerah was a collective singular, but he was using wordplay to point the fact that this Zerah, the ultimate Zerah in whom all the other Zerahs are going to be gathered, the one Zerah is going to be the Messiah, the King, Jesus. And so that's why Paul will say, so anyone who is in, if you are in Messiah, you are Abraham's Zerah, seed, and heirs according to the promise. What I don't want you to miss is like, yes, this is a psalm that has a lot of military imagery, conquering Messiah, ruling the, I mean, Psalm 2 did as well. This is like an expanded version of Psalm 2. But notice that it's in the context of this militaristic image that results in the praise of the nations, even the Gentiles. And so what we see is God's plan, his goal, the Messiah's purpose is not to wipe out the Gentiles. It's to bring in the Gentiles. But yet within that, those who set their might against God's people are setting themselves up for destruction. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And this is realized fully in those who set themselves against the anointed one of God. And in this Psalm, it's the Davidic king of Israel. But what we see is that ultimately it's the Messiah of Israel. So this Psalm very much finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And Jesus is the King of the Jews, as he said, but his kingdom is not of this world. And so this imagery that in the Psalms world seems to be a military battle being described with cosmic imagery, actually on this side of the cross, what we see is, oh no, that cosmic imagery is the real battle. 
and the military victories of Israel's messiahs through the centuries, in particular Davidic messiahs, were only foreshadows of what ultimate worldwide victory would be, which is not fought with shields and spears and swords, but rather is cosmic victory over the forces of evil and darkness and chaos and even death Sheol itself. So Psalm 18 is long. It's difficult at times. It has imagery that makes us uncomfortable. It's like, wait a minute, this King David's life didn't live up to this. My life doesn't live up to this. If God requited me what my righteousness deserved, I wouldn't be getting very much. So this Psalm, if we read it through a purely human lens, we're left with a conundrum. Who can live up to this? David certainly didn't. I certainly don't. None of the kings of Israel's history ever did. God's people as a whole never have. But yet this psalm is in scripture and it's being sung by or in honor to or about the events surrounding the life of his king, his Messiah, his seed. So that's why many people who read this say it's this song. If you read it carefully, it's pointing beyond itself to something greater. It's pointing to another son of David who is to come. And for those of us who are Christians, we know that son of David. And this psalm then sheds light on his ministry, that cosmic defeat of the ultimate evils, the true exodus, not from Egypt and physical labor, but from sin and death itself into the kingdom of God. So reading the psalm through that lens, it gets pretty profound. Reading it just at a human level, if you try, you could just say, yeah, this is just one more ancient Near East victory song, just like you see in the Babylonian, the Akkadian, the Egyptian uh, records. You see those everywhere. This is just another one. This is just the Hebrew version of it. And okay, yeah, if you don't have ears to hear, yeah, that's probably what you're going to conclude. But for those who are looking a little bit deeper and reading the rest of the story, including the rest of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, this takes on much deeper meaning. So wrestle with it, uh, read it, meditate on it, and see what you find as you continue studying this song. This is a long video, but again, this is the third longest psalm in the Bible, so of course it's not going to be a quick 20-minute jaunt. Hopefully you found it helpful. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you do, we would love for you to show that by subscribing to this channel if you haven't already and enabling notifications when you do. Other than that, uh, just anything you can do to get word of mouth out about Disciple Dojo, greatly appreciated. We'll see you back here next time when we jump back into Psalm 19. But for now, that'll do it. Take care. We'll see you next time. As always, keep training. (music) 